I want to start out with farming. Yes. You grew up on a farm. What's the importance of farming? Well, I think it's a, the balance between physical and mental. And so that if you're farming, it's not just rote labor, but you're thinking, how, how much money am I losing today? How much money are I'm coming in today? What's the value of my labor as far as the year-end bottom line? Or how can I improve uh, the pruners and the vineyard with me? Should this person be working over there? So you're thinking all the time, but then you're working all the time, physical. And if, you, if you're too physical, then you become brutish. And if you're too intellectual, you become a feat. So it's a perfect balance. It was, and it's practical. Very, and it, it makes you very self reliant because uh, there's nobody else but you. You you keep saying, "Am I going to get a paycheck this week?" It depends on the weather. It depends on labor. It depends on things that you can't calibrate. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't know why certain plums ripen at certain times. You you, you think you know, but then it surprises you. So there's always the unpredictable. That kind of creates a humility that you can't control things that you're kind of a tragedy there's a tragedy there that you cannot control but you have to prepare for it because you never know when you're going to lose a crop or something untoward will happen Uh, in my family one generation up everybody was a farmer and by the time they've all died or retired and i think whatever there are 14 children in the two families above me one was a farmer yeah and that's what's happened. What, did that change the country? It has. When the, the founders, 1776, 95% of the constituents, the people living in the United States, what is then, was then going to be the United States were farmers. And by the 1920s, it was about 45%. Now it's 1%. I think Jefferson said, when people are all piled up in the cities, it's not going to work anymore. And Tocqueville seemed to think that the reason in 1832 that things worked with you had all of these autonomous people and they were not like European peasants. They weren't subver- subservient or they didn't, they were not serfs or they were not uh, hard scrabble indentured uh, renters or something, but they were autonomous. I think that's really, that was very important. Doesn't mean that it can't be transferred that. Autonomy. You can have independent truck drivers. You can have small business people. But you need a lot of people who are not dependent on the government or a big corporation. And that type of confidence that accrues from that, they're they're very good citizens, and they're practical and they're common sense. The the difference with farming was it had a natural component. You can really see it with things like climate change or um, scientific research, quote-unquote, or government policy on nature written or directed or promulgated by people who don't have anything to do with nature Mm -hmm. other than just venture out on the weekends or something. And uh, if they're not living with nature, they don't really understand it, and especially if they don't make their living predicated on harnessing nature but not harming nature. It's kind of a partnership. But they romanticize nature because... Nature, they're, they're not dependent on nature. Uh, it, uh, of course, we live better by many measures than we lived when everybody was a farmer. Uh, are you suggesting there's a cost we have to pay in order to live like that? I don't know. I, I, as I, I turned 70 yesterday, and I had a grandfather who I live in his bedroom, and he lived in the bedroom of his great grandmother. So there's six generations. He died in this room when he was um, 86, and his wife, my grandmother, I took care of, she died at 93. They had three daughters. They died at 49. My mother died at 66, and her sister died at 60. And then um, I had a sister-in-law that died at 49. Another, Her sister died at 54, and I had a daughter that died at 26. And they all grew up in this farm, and then they went out stressful jobs uh, and they my grandparents stayed there and they got up they had a routine and I don't think they ever went more than a hundred miles they went to New Mexico one time in their life but they had a, a, a certain cyclical idea and so you they would say things today that seem absurd there's a south wind blowing you better be careful the birds are in the trees this is the phase of the moon 
and they were attuned to, they lived by nature and the cycles, and they had diaries, an almanac they kept for 50 years. And you could look at the day, and they would pretty much tell you what you had to do that day based on what they had done that day 40 years in a row. So I think that must have had something to do with longevity. But they did pay a price in the sense that they were constantly apprehensive about they had to live one more day. They didn't know where the income was coming in, the razor edge as far as the margin of profitability and unprofitability. But there was something about staying in one place. And I think some of the worst times I've had, it's getting into this, and you're as present no better than I do, the flying here or the flying there and getting detached from being one in one place and stationary. And I think it's not good for people. So uh, one piece of advice for young people might be uh, spend some time throughout your life doing something real. Yeah, do something real and cultivate family. I, I think that's important. That don't just say that that's my sister so that we're close or that's my best friend so we're close. It's sort of farmers, they tend to uh, maintain relationships or friendships a long time because everybody knows what they are, are, what they do, where they're going to be, and they're not going to move suddenly, and you're going to lose them. So that I think that was important. Hmm. Uh, my, uh, to me, a farm, growing up, uh, my father was the first one to go to college in either family. And so we lived in the city, that is to say, Pocahontas, 6,000 people. But uh, I would go to the farm, and to me, the farm was a playground, to all my aunts and uncles and my parents, the farm was work, 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 work. And uh, they missed it, and they didn't both. Yeah, but they had something real, a connection. They'd worked in the fields together as little kids. Yeah, I have an ambiguous relationship because I saw it bankrupt a lot of people in my family. But on the other hand, I live there, and so if I walk out, I'll see a horseshoe in the dirt if I'm digging, or I'll see a remnant of somebody, or I'll see a, a barn that I remember somebody being there when I was five, the exact same place. It's kind of haunts you. You're in a, a house and you can think of every room or every window where somebody from the 19th century, they even talked different, they had different accents, and they had different vocabularies, and you can remember all of that. And you do kind of dumb things. I have eight eight buildings on around my house. There's an old shed. There's a barn. And they should have been all been torn down. They were built in 1870 to 1880 with eucalyptus poles. And so I found myself the last few years flying all over the country to speak, to get money, then to rebuild these things that there's no purpose for, other than my grandfather would say, I'd really like to have these buildings in good shape one day. Well, now they're all in good shape, but I don't use them. The, thing, the place looks beautiful, but it's only because I wasn't farming. If I was farming, they wouldn't be there. They would have been <laughs> bankrupt and sold. Great. So the classics. You have spent a lot of time studying the ancient world, and you know the languages. Yeah. Well, that's hard. I've heard you say it takes 2,000 hours to become competent in ancient Greek. I... I I came up with that number because I used to teach a lot of minority kids for 20 years in classics, and I had to make the argument to their parents. So I would say, you know, there's 52 weeks a year, and you're going to have to spend, if you did 10 hours uh, a week, it wouldn't be enough, it'd be 500, but you can, it's going to be 2,000 hours. You can do it in two years, three years, but ultimately you're going to have to spend that amount of tower, uh to learn Latin Greek. I, I went to an, uh, kind of an ossified classical. Believe it or not, Stanford was the, or with Harvard in those days was the classical philology department. It wasn't ancient history. It wasn't archaeology. It wasn't art history. It wasn't comparatively. It was just pure language. And we had to learn how to re read and write in Greek and Latin, take dictation in Greek and Latin, take courses in Mandarin. It was very narrow. I remember my brother was kind of a smart, uh, smart aleck, very brilliant guy, and I came home, and my father said, what did you learn? And he said, he's like Samuel Johnson's dog. He can um, walk on two legs. It's very interesting, but we don't know the purpose of it. He thought that was what Greek was. He said he can write Greek and Latin, and then my dad said, well, 
that'll do you good. I want you to go over and wire a uh, raisin dehydrator at 220 and rebuild it. And I said, I'm not sure I can do that. And he said, if you can spend all this time reading Greek, you should learn how to do that. And he didn't give me any instruction. He just said, go do it, and then I can see your education is valuable. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. So I had to... How did the interest in that dawn in you? It was just an accident. I was from a farm, and I went to University of Santa, California, Santa Cruz. It was kind of a hippie. It just opened. It was supposedly the place everybody wanted to go. My father picked it because all three of us got in. He thought it would be cheaper, and we could all live together in a rental house. And I was in a class, and there was this wonderful professor named John Lynch, and I did pretty well on a Western Civ. And he said, would you like to study Latin and Greek? And I said, no. My mother had grown up on the farm, and she was a lawyer, a judge at that time. And I thought, wow, I want to be a lawyer. And then he said, you're doing pretty well. Why don't you go take Yale, uh, go to Yale summer school and take Greek after your freshman year? And I said, I'm only 18. And he said, well, everybody's in their late 20s. If you survive that intensive Greek program, and it was pretty traumatic for me. I'd never been out of California so then I started doing pretty well. I came back and I, it was, he, that whole classics group at UC Santa Cruz had come from Yale and they were philologists, believe it or not. So when I graduated, he, uh, he was always telling, now you can go to Greece. So my parents would come home and said, what are you going to do with this? And I said, I don't know. I am pretty good at it. And they always give me money. So then I applied to graduate school and she said, well, she was a Stanford chauvinist. My grandfather had mortgages his farm and sent two of his girls to Stanford to get BAs and advanced degrees. And she said, well, we're we're a Stanford family. I said, I'm not going to go there. And and then I asked this, my, my mentor and he said, yeah, they they have a really good philology department and they'll pay your entire way Mm -hmm. if you can get in. So they had examinations to take. And then I was 25 and I looked at the job market and there was no jobs for a white male that knew Latin and Greek. (laughs) <laughs> so I came home to take care of my grandparent, my grandmother for a summer. And the next thing I knew, I stayed five years farming full time. And then at some point, I didn't have any money. I wasn't doing too well. And there was a campus at Cal State Fresno. I'd never really been there, 30 miles away. And I walked in and asked if I could teach a Latin class. And they said, they'll think about it for three years. First day I got there, I parked on campus. And the secretary said I had tracked mud in because I was irrigating and going back and forth. And then the next thing I did, I went out to the parking lot and there were the police were there around my pickup. I said, Mr. Mr. What's your name? And I said, Hanson. He said, what are you doing? You have a shotgun in the window. And that's against the law to have a state campus. Is the, is the firearm loaded? And I said, yeah, I shoot things that on the farm. I don't remember when a coyote. And they didn't believe that I was a faculty member. And the very nice guy, I got to know him really well. He said, I didn't see any of this. Put the gun, tuck it better down, and never bring it on campus again. That was my first day at Clint Campus. <laughs> God bless That was 20 years I stayed there, so it got better. 